Oi, oi, all right, all right, how's it going? I'm Grant, you're you, this is Doodle Review. Today's episode of Ulterior Underground, I'm very excited to share a long conversation I had with Joe Cardamone, aka Skeleton Joe, aka the Wild Rock Shaman frontman of the Icarus line. Chances are, if you click this, you know exactly who Joe is and the, who the Icarus line are, but if you, you know, arrived here on a whim and are interested, I recently put together a retrospective of that band, which is linked in the description. Give this a pause, hit that one up, get knowledge up, come back. This is a long one. Joe was very kind enough to give up his time to talk in depth about the history of the Icarus line and we literally went album by album. I set aside an hour and we blew right by it. Joe, you're a legend. It's probably one you're gonna to have to watch in stages and that's fine, take it at your leisure. But if you're a fan, you'll most certainly wanna watch the whole thing because there are some great stories and great insights about Icarus that um, I've never really heard kind of documented anywhere else. So a quick note before we go into it, things started out classically uh, with some technical difficulties, but I kept the initial part in because I just really liked uh, the story Joe recounted of first meeting Alvin de Guzman. Uh, that part lasts no more than a couple of minutes and then we get reset up where the signal was perfect. So yeah, just stick with it. <clears throat> All right, here's my full conversation with Joe Cardamone of the Icarus Line. I hope I remember something, you know? <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed. But um, no worries if not. I mean, we're talking talking a long time. I was going to say that the um, the story, I guess, starts with the Cankasaurs, right? Prior to, to the Icarus Line. Yeah, really, uh, I think uh, the core of the group started even earlier than that probably in like catholic school alvin and i started playing music together real uh real early um i think it was like uh fifth grade fourth grade something like that and wow. um i was pretending that i knew how to play you know i was i was <laughs> like uh i had a guitar and knew like three chords and uh he i don't know what like he was gonna draw a cover for a demo tape that i was making that didn't exist or never was gonna exist and i was like cool man yeah yeah you go ahead draw the cover you know whatever instead of drawing the cover he ended up like secretly buying bass and uh and i was like oh yeah that's cool um he almost instantly was like far more advanced than I was. Like he could already play, you know, songs or whatever it was. So, so you were just talking about um, you and Alvin making music way back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, just to kind of like short version of what I said was, uh, we met in Catholic school and uh, I started fucking around with guitars and stuff. And um, I don't know, we, we made friends during a school project or something like that. And I told him I wanted to do music and he kind of laughed at me. He was like, why, you know? <laughs> he, I don't think he really, he was like, what do you mean? Um, and then he secretly bought a bass guitar and you know, two weeks later was better than better than I was. And I had been trying to play for like a year and a half or something like that. He was like, he instantly could play kind of anything he heard, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. So good. Inst instantly gifted, you know? I love that. I also love that his first response was when you said you wanted to make music was why? Because that's something people hear all of the time when you say that as well. It's kind of, kind of valid. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he was, uh, he wasn't, you know, he was raised in a sort of, uh, uh, like a conservative, semi-conservative religious family, you know, right. and I, you know, so that wasn't really on the menu as far but, as like career choices. But he took to it straight away. Oh yeah. Yeah. He was running circles around everyone. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll learn how to sing. Um, well, I was um, for ages when I was like prepping for this, I just kind of assumed that I, I couldn't hear any um, any stuff. But like 
I guess someone doing the Lord's good work on YouTube uploaded a um, couple of EPs. I think it was the Pivot EP. Yeah. It sounded super fun. Like considering I'd spent the last few weeks like steeped in specifically the Icarus line, it was completely not what I what I expected. How old were you at that at that point? I mean, we were we were kids, man. I think like maybe 16, 17, something like that. I mean, we were really young. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and we were just kind of, uh, I mean, that the our high school punk band was kind of, uh, it was an excuse to be able to play music with people that uh, didn't really know how to play music, you mm-hmm. know, just like an excuse to play with friends really was the thing. Uh, totally. You know, it was like, oh, we can teach whoever to like, play bass and Alvin can play guitar you know it was it it was kind of it was set up just to be something that like we could do with friends instead of having to you know uh audition musicians or whatever (laughs) someone's keen to get in or get out yeah 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 he wanted to come in Zeus wants to he wants to be part of the the thing okay yeah here I'll put a blanket on you just chill chill here okay here you go can you sit here and not be a dickhead? Stand. He's uh he's he's seventeen years old, this guy. Oh wow. Oh yeah, man. Yeah. Old timer. He's, he's an old timer, yeah. But he's uh you know, he's still a prick just like he was when he was four, you know. He just wants to hear the story, man. He just wants to hear the good the good stuff. Oh, he's sick of my shit. He's like, <laughs> he's like no one wants to hear this crap, bro. Uh, <laughs> but (laughs) so so you guys you're like 16 17 i mean i when i listened to it and you correct me if i'm wrong but i was hearing like descendants like bit of no fx and all of that sort of stuff was that is that kind of like what you guys were into at the time are there any other influences that were kind of making their way yeah 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 i mean it was like uh southern california early punk you know like black flag descendants uh even like a few little east coast bands like born against was a favorite band of ours or at least mine mm-hmm. minor Threat, you know um the misfits like all all that high school punk stuff all the stuff you get into when you like you know someone the cramps gun club whatever when they give you your first punk tape that's pretty much what we were you know we were like a a jukebox of our influences at the time totally do you have any of that stuff like i was i loved it when i was listening to it i was wondering if you have any of those like have you pressed any up at the time or oh yeah there's like i think i still have like some singles from then because uh the pivot ep came out on recess mm-hmm. which is uh, a label that's run by uh todd congelier from the band fyp and toys that kill and mm-hmm. we really kind of looked up to them you know when we were younger we we were really like oh wow they're you know they were such a kind of a explosive band that was like a DIY punk band that got to tour the States. And, you know, it was like really, uh, really, a you know, kind of a be in our bonnet or whatever. When we got to do a single with recess, it was like, it was the coolest thing to us. We were, we, that was it. We were like, we made it, we're done. Mm-hmm. You know? um, yeah. I imagine that must've been, it must've been awesome. What was it like? Did you play in shows at that time? I imagine if you were playing like shows around LA and whatnot, like what was it for you guys to be like 15, 16, 17 in those situations? Was it like a kind of massive change or were you always kind of around that sort of scene anyway? Like, how did it feel? (laughs) I mean, we were, you know, I in particular was very motivated to play shows because I was, uh, so unmotivated at school you know i didn't i barely even participated in school half the time i'm sleeping under a tree outside class instead of going into the class you know whatever Mm -hmm. so a lot of um but i still have a lot of energy at this point you know i'm young i have a lot of energy i need to put it somewhere um so i promoted a lot of the shows um myself i would organize a lot of the shows at any venue 
I mean, not even venues, a coffee shop that was foolish enough to let us, you know, <laughs> hey, someone's going to, kids are going to come listen to us play and buy coffee and uh, we'll keep the door and you sell the coffee. And they're like, oh, it sounds great, kid. And then like a hundred kids show up and <laughs> you know, the place turns into mayhem. But um, at that point, I would say we probably played two or three shows a weekend, believe it or wow. not. You know, it was a, it was Friday, Saturday and Sunday if we could, uh, mm -hmm. everywhere from Los Angeles, San Diego, anywhere that we could drive to from where we lived, you know, so anywhere we could get to in a night and back, we would play there and LA is huge. So you could really, yeah. you could really play all the time if you wanted to. And we did, you know, from backyard shows to basement shows to Jerry's pizza in Bakersfield, um, and then eventually, I think because we were so kind of industrious, uh, promoters started putting us on shows with other groups. You know, we started playing with a lot of the local uh, punk bands like uh, Naked Aggression and Final Conflict and Total Chaos and all these kind of like uh, crusty punk bands, which is strange yeah. because we weren't really you know that but it's just what it was i mean that's what the scene was back then and we we're loud and fast so they would put us on the shows and yeah totally. i feel like punk shows especially in those sorts of like local scenes you know it's always a bit of a mishmash of like styles within the umbrella right you're gonna get you're gonna get something crushed you're gonna get something hardcore something kind of classic punk totally which, which is great you know mm. which is kind because then it's bringing, it's bringing all kinds of bands together. And really, when it's kids from high school going to the shows, they don't really care. You know what I mean? Everyone's there to just like have a good time and listen to music. I think everyone's pretty uh, kind of open minded towards cross pollinization at that point. And like you're just not in your bedroom, so it's a win. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So, what was the? Um if you don't mind me asking like what was the journey a bit from cankersaurs to the icus line and i understand obviously there, there was some loss within that so feel free to go in as much detail as you want as you're comfortable to sure um trying to think like uh i mean the main the main impetus i guess is like uh tim our drummer passing away but also um you know, the band had kind of slowed down. I dropped out of school, moved to Long Beach. Mm -hmm. um, I'm living with two other bands, Le Shock and Treadwell, which are like kind of uh, Long Beach punk bands. I'm living in, in the like main living room on a mattress, you know, by the wall behind where everybody watches TV and then everyone else has a bedroom. So I'm kind of... You know, I'm I'm the youngest one. I'm kind of squatting in the living room um, and have a job at a record label. And basically, I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with my life because I'm not going to school anymore. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't want to live in my parents' backyard. So I'm out trying to earn a living. Mm -hmm. At this point, we're still recording as canker sores a little bit. We have some songs that are left over. Um, that we had been working on. So we were recording with Rusty, the guitar player from Tre Treadwell. We're doing a new Kanker Source demo with our um, then drummer, Tim Childs. At this time, Tim is uh, killed in a kind of, a, I guess a car accident. You know, he, he's like gone to a rave in the desert in Arizona and on the way back, who knows what happens, but he's thrown from the car and dies in the middle of the desert. And this is pre cell phone, you know, so uh, he's there with a few of his friends, everybody else survives and, you know, they're not within help. So he dies there in front of his friends. It took like, you know, an hour or some change for help to get there. And by the time they got there, Tim's gone. So, um, at, yeah, yeah. And he was 18 years old. We're all around 18, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, after, man, that's awful. Yeah, it, you know, uh, it's like a real, real kind of quick brush with mortality early on, you mm. know, especially when it's somebody that you're close to that's your age. Um, yep. I think it impacts your psyche in a way. Um, so, you know, after that happened, 
I think I was working at Revelation Records, like a hardcore label in uh, Huntington Beach around that time. And um, Alvin decided he didn't really, Alvin was really, um, you know, he was grieving the loss and he decided he didn't want to play for a while. And it affected me the opposite. I wanted to like immediately get out, you know, Lean into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I pressed up, you know, some cassettes of the four songs we had done at Rusty's studio mm-hmm. with him on, on drums and um, blagged our way into a tour with Ink and Dagger on the East Coast. Um, my roommates knew them. I didn't really know them. And uh, I found out they were going on tour. I ended up like calling from my desk at Revelation, kind of like uh, maybe sor- sort of leveraging my uh, position at the company to get the call. You know what I right. mean? I'm like, hey, what's up? It's me, Joe from whatever, you know? And, uh, you know, I remember the singer Sean from Meek and Dagger saying, well, if you can get out here, you can go on, you can, we'll put you on the tour probably probably him assuming that like that's not going to happen yeah uh, kind of laying yeah. the challenge down and just being like See, like if you can do it yeah yeah if you can get here you're on you know which is so insane you know um in this day and age who's doing that right totally. so we uh i'm like yeah great we're doing it so i quit my job and uh we get in aaron's pickup truck we don't have a drummer yet at the time we just have this demo it's me aaron and lance lance is playing bass aaron's playing guitar no drummer we knew this drummer in bakersfield we asked him if he wants to go on tour with us on the east coast uh three or four days notice uh with ink and dagger he says yes this kid named the nooch we put him in the truck two people in the front of the truck two people laying down in the bed with gear and we drive straight nonstop to Philadelphia. The drummer's in the front with Aaron listening to the tape, playing on his, you know, lap, learning the music so that we can play the show when we get there. Um, we get there the night before the first show. I think, uh, I forget whose house we show up to. I forget what address is given. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and we're reading like maps. You know what I mean? There's yeah. no GPS. We're reading maps. No one's ever driven in Philly before. We're just like, where the fuck are we? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Just looking out for street signs, being like, is that that? that? Pretty much. And we, I, I'm pretty sure we got off on the worst street in Philadelphia. You know what I mean? We like missed our exit by one, and it was just like, ah, oh, fuck, this place is a demilitarized zone, you know? Yeah. Uh, we finally make our way to the Ink and Dagger house. I think the first member of the band that shows up is Sean the singer and he walks in and just starts rolling joints and Lance starts rolling joints and everyone starts smoking weed. And it's just, we're, it, you know, we're hanging out at a friend's house. You know what I mean? It's like, Oh, yeah. okay. We're all fucking the same kind of people. Let's get high. Um, the first show is the next night, I think in New Brunswick, we had never played as a band in this configuration no rehearsal everyone get on stage set it up you know i probably take my shirt off and we just go fucking nuts you know and i think that night i met everyone from ink and dagger met everyone from dillinger escape plan the first Uh time and they were they had just I don't even know if they had released their first thing yet you know it was really kind of early on but there was a bunch of people met joe burns met just met a bunch of people i was going to know for a long time all yeah. on the side of this tour you know and so you know back then everyone booked their own tours you know what i mean there wasn't like indie booking agents as much you know there was mm-hmm. some it was more uh it was normal for like bands of a very smaller size to just book your own shows, you know, and you would do this through word of mouth, through uh, this publication called Book Your Own Fucking Life that Maximum Rock and Roll used to publish like once a year that just had numbers of venues, vegan restaurants, basements, bookstores, anarchists, libraries, whatever the fuck, right? Yeah. We, you know, 
Ink and Dagger had booked the tour. I'm pretty sure maybe someone helped them. But anyways, every night when we get to the venue on this tour, they have to let the venue know that we're playing. Mm -hmm. That's how the venues are finding out that there's another band on the show. And like, mostly they're fine. They're like, okay, great. You know, and that's how we're doing it. And um, so that's, that's, uh, that's how the Icarus line was born. I think we didn't even have that name before that tour. We just needed a name for a t-shirt and to put on the cassette tape before we left so that we would have something to sell. And that was it. Yeah. That is wild. Yeah. Total chaos. Like nobody, no plan, no nothing. You know I mean? It's just like uh, more kind of just, you know, inertia than anything, you know, just Just get into it. So yeah. So was the stuff that you'd recorded that you had on that track, was this the highly puncturing noise? What became that? Um, it might be some of those songs, but it's not that recording. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 I think maybe one or two of those songs, I can't remember exactly, uh-huh. but it's, not, it's not that recording. No. And I don't think we've ever, we've never released it managed to find something on YouTube that says it was that, <laughs> but I think, um, I think, I think it might be up there, you know, I'd like, you know, 50 copies escaped on that yeah. trip. I have a couple here, you know, I just never cared to put it up, you know, but yeah, it's not, yeah, it's its own thing, you know, and it was kind of, it was also kind of nice to be able to um, have the first Icarus line, like release or whatever you want to call it, have Tim mm-hmm. on it for us. Yeah so that we kind of carried him forward into uh the next evolution of something we started as kids together you know I, it was meaningful to us to to be able to do that i think it was a really nice um that's a really nice touch and it was something that i picked up on when i was like um listening listening to that of obviously not only is it a great tribute but those snippets towards the end and how they fit at the end of those songs also kind of sort of you can see the trajectory of where the band would go based off of that if you know what yeah. i mean because it, if it rather than it just being those straight up hardcore songs that ended there like these more abstract bits at the end it kind of almost foreshadowed what's That's come right. right well here's the thing is like tim was way cooler than any of us you know what I mean? He was like, he was into cooler th- music than like anybody else in the band in a way. I mean, at least me anyways, you know, he was just kind of, uh, he was like exposed to s- cooler shit and was like more open-minded. You know, I was, I, I'm always, always very myopic at, at the time, you know, I'm very like mm-hmm. zero on whatever I'm trying to kind of like, uh, you know, express, you know, and um, after he passed, those those snippets in between are um just jam sessions of him and lance you know lance used to go over there and press record on his tape player and just like whatever they would just get stoned and you know jam for like hours or whatever you know um but yeah tim was probably uh he was he was the best musician in the band for sure that's so well it's so fitting that he was on there so that then was on the red and black red and black attack ep yeah. right so it was Am I right in saying that that there's there was something that came out on Hellcat, wasn't there, on Tim Armstrong's label? Was it that? Yeah, um, yeah, both both those were recorded at the same time. Right. Red and Black EP and the uh, Hellcat one were both recorded at the same time for whatever purpose. I don't even know if we knew where the, the songs were going at that point, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think it's aaron austin playing drums on those songs and some of them had been around and some of them were you know maybe in the chamber waiting to be uh realized but uh yeah i think it was aaron austin the drummer from uh naked aggression whose band had also imploded um in the same summer that like tim died the guitar player from naked aggression died he had an asthma attack while they were driving from San Francisco to LA. And again, this is, you know, couldn't get help fast enough. And he died like right there in the fucking van in front of uh, his wife. It was a husband wife um, project and Aaron was the drummer. And so he was kind of an orphan at that, that time and just a fantastic drummer, great guy. And he uh, ended up 
I mean, I think we only played one or two shows together, but really, the, he really uh, kind of captured the spirit of what everyone was feeling on that re recording. Yeah. It's awesome. I mean, I mean, awesome that he was able to do that. Obviously, kind of awful events leading up to that. Um, it was a weird year, you know, there was like a, there was like a triple, there was triple deaths, you know, it was, uh, you know, Phil from Naked Aggression and then Joe Ciari, the bass player of FYP, you know, the label that put out the canker sores, mm. seven inches and just friends, family affiliates, uh, the bass player of FYP ends up uh, taking his own life that summer. So there's this like trio of funerals and, uh, you know, a, a lot of loss, you know, felt within a, a small circle of um, musicians and friends that year, you know? Yeah. Shit. But I, I mean, it seems like a lot of, a lot of that scene or people such as yourself were able to like harness that to propel forward into something else, which is the positive, I suppose you can, if you can take anything from that sort of thing. Sure. Well, you know, you have this like a uh, thing you do that you can use to, um, hopefully sort out, you know, any sort of uh, traumas that you're experiencing, especially at that age, you don't really know anything about, uh, or at least I didn't, no, none of us did. We didn't know anything about, you know, uh, therapies or anything like this. You know what I mean? Music is pretty much was the closest thing to it. And we didn't even see it that way. You know, it was more mm. just like a fucking bloodletting, you know, and yeah. uh, you don't even think about why you just go, you know? Totally. Yeah. It's a lot to go through at like such a, such a young age. And like you say, it's something that you're always conscious of. Um, but when you lose someone and you're younger, you kind of have this weird brush with something that you always knew was there, but you didn't think was in your, going to be in your, you know, peripheral for a long time. And then it kind of changes your whole perception of everything. At least I mean, that's how I felt about a similar experience. Yeah, death didn't mean anything to me before that. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, you're you're when you're 17. I mean, death feels so far away. Mm -hmm. you know, it just doesn't it? Just, it just doesn't really mean anything to you. It's just like this uh, thing that um, happens to grandparents, you know, um, you know, or other people, or these tra tragedies you hear about secondhand, and then all of a sudden, um, when you're front row for it um that's when that's when it becomes um personal you know mm. really and you realize that is uh that is it that is that is the end of the line at least for now you know and you gotta you know you have to figure out how to um be okay with it it's like a defining thing for sure right um how so just the thinking of the timeline there's quite a long time between red and black and then what eventually was released as mono right what can you give us some sort of idea of what what the kind of that journey between those two releases looked like what was happening there yeah i think um let me see i think buddy head starts to erupt or at least starts to rumble at this point you know uh -huh. Travis is in town. We start working together on a lot of different things, you know, shows, releases, whatever, you know, I'm introducing him to people I know, vice versa. Um, and we're doing tours. I think maybe we have a manager at this point, you know, uh, I do at the drive-ins first show in LA at my record store. I actually end up, uh, helping out the drive and get signed to one of the labels I'm working at, you know? So there's all, you know, oh. it, it's a community at this point. Everyone's kind of like throwing together and, um, the, you know, there's a little bit of excitement in the community that, uh, you know, there's bands that are maybe pushing the sound forward a little bit, you know, taking from like, you know, punk and post-punk and whatever. And, uh, mixing it with whatever you know whatever the contemporary uh feel is of the time but um yeah i think we're mostly just trying to tour as much as possible and release records like i know we did a kill kill cupid single and that mm -hmm. was 
limited edition thing on Valentine's Day. First show at the Smell downtown LA, we gave everybody a copy. As long as you paid to get in, you get a seven inch, you know? Um, and I think wow. only ever available at that show, you know? Um, That's the Holy Grail right there. Yeah, you know, it was, it was wild. Cause it, at, at that point we're just like, oh, this would be fun. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I don't even know how, you know, Travis figured out how to pay for it. You know, he's got some kind of financing coming into Buddy Head at this point. And I think I'm working for Buddy Head a little bit, like trying to like get advertisers or something. I don't know. There, we, we were trying to like organize some kind of, uh, you know, proper business at the time. N not that we knew how to do anything, you know what I mean? But we're trying. Um, but mostly we're just touring and kind of, uh, you know, trying to figure out how to get an album out. Mm-hmm. That's really what it is. It's like, okay, so we want to make an album, you know, like uh, we want to, it, it seems like you have to have a, a full length record to, uh, you know, really like support a tour. And I'm, I think I moved back into my parents' backyard for like a summer. They have like a little shed out here that I lived in. Mm. And I remember it took me about two or three weeks, but I demoed mono out from start to finish um, with the band in this shed. I mean, the shed's like four feet by five feet. I mean, it's tiny. We used to rehearse yeah. and, you know. Sweatbox. Um, yeah. And I had some kind of digital recorder, you know, uh, like one of those Roland shits or whatever, like eight tracks. I don't, I don't remember. You know, I barely knew how to use it. I just like knew it enough. Three mics up on Jeff's kit. Um, Jeff Watson has joined the band at this point um, and, uh, you know, demoed every song. I wish I fucking had a copy of it, you know, because mm -hmm. it was the only version of the record where I'm playing guitar on it. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. I don't I don't even think there's vocals, though. I think it was just it's the entire mono record instrumental with me playing guitar. I'm pretty so sure that those songs must have then been gestating for quite a while over that period for you guys to just kind of nail it down or did it change again once you actually got to record it the next version of it see in in those days there was no digital recording so you really kind of um and with a with a small budget you wanted to at least have a pretty good indication of what you were going to do mm -hmm. in this least feel confident or i wanted to because i didn't want to have to go in there and um you know feel mm -hmm. underprepared even though i always was anyways but like you know we tried to map out at least the instrumental portion of the record pretty well and i think everybody went home with the tape and it was mm -hmm. like here you know figure this out learn it know what you're gonna do and then we're going in um mate that sounds well organized that's that's like a for, from yeah. a band's point of view that's like a military operation oh yeah i was psychotic you know <laughs> really i really you know because there was just you know there was parts that i just wanted to make sure came off the way that you know i was hearing them back at that point um and also if that's under control that also offers me freedom to just kind of um go nuts on vocals you know because yep. i didn't really know what i was doing there and um i forget when it kind of came about but crank records ends up s signing us at some point we, we have a we scored a manager he saw us play somewhere i don't know i can't remember shit like that but uh it's a this guy blaze who also managed at the drive-in and he also managed murder city devils and so you know to us that seemed like you know, decent company to be in. They're like people we know, people we relate to, similar sort of uh, trajectories here, uh, you know, at least enough. Mm. Uh, and he figures out how to get us a record deal, you know, and I think it was like we have $10,000 to record a record, which to us is like might as well be 10 yeah, million. Yeah, it's you know massive. I mean? Yeah, totally. yeah, yeah that point i don't think we had spent more than 500 dollars on a recording like mm -hmm. you know ever and it was like you go in record the song and then i sing the song 
then we mix it and we go home and it's done, you know, mm-hmm. or, or however many songs, if it's six, we do six that day. So this is kind of like um, such an extravagant, luxurious uh, moment in our lives because we're going to be able to go into a studio and there, we're going to hire a producer even, you know, which yep. is like, oh, okay, we're going to hire a fucking producer. So we end up uh, hiring Mark Trombino because he was the, the reason was because he was the drummer of Drive Like Jehu. You know, I, you know, that was I need any more reason. Yeah. We didn't know shit. You know what I mean? It was like, that record sounds cool. Hopefully he had something to do with it. Uh, let's go, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so we hired Trombino. He sets up the studio. We get in there and um, I think we record all of Mono's basic tracks in like two or three days, you know, mm-hmm. all, all the drums and bass and probably most of the guitar is done in two or three days, take another day to do some more guitars. And then it's time for me to do vocals and I have no fucking idea what I'm going to do. Um, and it didn't go well. It didn't right. go well at all. Um, there was, there was some kind of, I, I was a fucking, I was just a prick at the time anyways. You know what I mean? I'm like obsessed with the uh, fun house or something. And like Mark Trombino is playing me clips from like, uh, I don't even remember what it was. It was like Skylarking or something like that. You know, he was like playing me songs from Skylarking and I'm playing him stuff from fun house. And we're just, it's not, yeah. it's not, it's not working out. Right. And so I'm in a bad mood and he's probably like, this guy's a fucking asshole. Like, I, I'm sure of it. He's just like, this guy's a fucking prick, you know? And uh, he puts up a nice expensive mic and uh, it just, I, I, I wasn't comfortable. It doesn't go anywhere. We end up parting ways. Right. Record's not that's, finished. No vocals. Um, that's, that's cra- and- like crazy that you were, I don't know, that, not that you were being that way, but more that you had the foresight to know that it wasn't working. Because I feel like most bands, if they're given their first chance to record something, they're given that money, they're all swept up in the, the yeah. thing of it, that they would just kind of go with the flow. But I guess at that point you were still like, nah, this isn't it. Nah, like as soon as the XTC song came on, you know, I was just like. No, this fuck. isn't it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I've since seen him at Donut Friend. I apologize, you know, even though there's no apology needed. It just wasn't a match, right? Yeah. Um, but I, I definitely was probably rude about it. You know what I mean? I was like, fuck this guy. He's fired or whatever. You know, I was just, I was a prick. I was a young asshole. Um, and so we've spent pretty much all the money and we have an unfinished record. We have a record with no vocals on it, you know? So I think our manager sweet talks the label and it's like, we'll get you a couple more days at the studio, but we need to get someone who can, you know, work with you so that we can get this thing done and you need to come here prepared and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Prepare this. Um, And uh, we hire Alex Newport who had just finished working on at the drive-ins record. Uh, You know, he was in, his own band fudge on all like noisy shit, you know, kind of a, kind of a, maybe a little less conventional of a producer than Mark Trombino, which is probably, probably a good switch up at this point because to Trombino's credit, the tracks that he did for the instrumental portion of the record are fantastic. The drums mm-hmm. sound great. Like, you know, we got a so lot out of everything. Did everything kind of stay from those like, Totally. tracks oh, amazing totally i mean it sounds fantastic it's just once we came down to vocals you know i want to roll around in a pit of filth and he's like trying to understand what i'm saying i'm like bro i'm not saying anything <laughs> um, you know um and alex newport clocks this immediately mm-hmm. i go to the studio meet him and he's like here and he hands me a 57 with a dictaphone tape recorder, you know, with those little tapes, um, yep. do with things like to record notes mm-hmm. and they're taped together. And that's going to be the vocal microphone, you know, that's, and 
it seems much more in the in the style <laughs> at the time it was perfect pushes me in the room and then i'm just like growling on this thing for three days and you know three days later we have a record yeah man the magic really happened it sounds it sounds i still love that you know that record is so pure in what you guys were at that time um it's crazy to hit think that it came out of so, like such a from a vocal point of view you know craziness but it also makes sense yeah yeah it was just like open page of journal look at it press record you know more or less maybe there were some things that have had been worked out at shows like moments and songs but even at that point at shows often i was ad-libbing at at least certain points in each song you know that was always kind of um I don't know, it just didn't occur to me that like, you know, these songs didn't have courses or like uh, hooks per se. So it was like, who gives a shit? Like, I'll just do mm. something every night. And like, the studio was another show, you know, basically. So like the recording is kind of, uh, you know, whatever was captured that week on those songs, but it was probably different before that. And did you yeah. afterwards try and like... Recreate it? The, yeah, recreate it. Did you just evolve it i think so like to a certain extent yeah you know it was like i think probably at that point more than any other point in the uh career of the band we tried to recreate the album live at least mm -hmm. to a certain extent you know and that was like a really kind of rare for us to be honest like after that point we really just stopped doing that you know yeah um, yeah but yeah, I think I think we tried to recreate it as much as possible live, or or at least used it as like something to drive the live show, you know. Well, I noticed on like um, some of the stuff that got released later and recordings that you were definitely playing stuff around. So I've heard like, is it Fiji Cat to a Cobra mixed with White Devil, and like those sorts of interpolations would start to happen later on. For sure, for sure, always, always kind of doing that stuff. So most we don't want to play, we didn't even want to play feed a cat or whatever. So we would be like, how can we get away with only playing like a third of the song? <laughs> so, fuck, here we go. You know. Love that. So w when it gets around to penance now, I, I had a, uh, I don't know whether I'm misremembering something. I read Keith Morris's book years ago and sure. I'm sure he talked in that about working with you guys signing you guys is that right or have i misremembered that no no he so mono before mono comes out uh -huh. a label called sweet nothing under cargo in the uk this guy named simon keeler here's the band and that's who really kind of like breaks the group in the uk you know right. what i mean that's who breaks the group in the UK. And uh, I mean, we're going from playing to like a hundred people here and like, they're like, Hey, why don't you come over and play some shows in the UK for a show we show up? It's like 800 people. Like what the fuck's going on here? Oh, sick. That must have been yeah, amazing. Yeah. 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 It was, it was definitely, you know, it was like, Oh, we're, we're definitely gonna be able to find some weed here. You know what I mean? <laughs> it, Do you remember where you played? Do you remember like your first show over here, like venue wise? what was it called i d i don't know but i know the the garage was on that tour but i think it was at the end the first right. one was lisa and firkin is that a fucking place Might right be before my time maybe exactly uh let's just say that's what it was called uh i think it was and we like showed up and they're like you're gonna do some interviews we're like who the fuck wants to interview us you know what I mean? And we like do some interviews and we're like, oh God, this place is big. This is going to be sad. You know, like we're sitting there like after sound check, like this is going to be tough, man. Why would they big us? What, this place is too big. You know, why they book us here? And uh, then it fills up and we're like, I, I think I threw up before we went on or something like this. You know what I mean? It was just like, this is fun. Um, so from there, um, kind of the sort of energy of that, transfers back home as it does and people start paying attention over here and i think yeah like a year or two after a, like a year after 
we've gone to the UK a few times and the shows in LA are starting to, uh, you know, grow in momentum. And that's when major labels start wanting to talk to us or court us. And to be honest, most of them, I don't think are really interested in signing us. They're just, they just want to meet us, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, they just want to kind of lay eyes on us and be it because of buddy head, be it because of our reputation, whatever it is. And the ones that maybe are semi interested in, uh, signing us all have suggestions. You know, they all have suggestions for like what the fuck we could do to kind of make the band go over more, you know, and be mm-hmm. more successful. All of them, you know, they're like, you know, you guys, you, you know, work with this producer, we'll get some hooks, whatever, you know. Um, and at this point, we've recorded a three song demo here in mm-hmm. LA on our own. Um, the demo is. Kiss Like Lizards, Bright at Night, and Big Sleep. Mm-hmm. That's the, and it's like all connected as one suite, kind of how it is on the album, right? It's yeah. not the same, but it's the same idea. This is the demo we're bringing to major labels. So we're like plunking down this like 20 minute hunk of music and we're like, let's go, sign us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's ridiculous. You know, we're like, if you if you don't like it, you're fucking stupid. You know, it's that kind of thing. And, you know, we're in these like boardrooms. Like I remember going to Warner Brothers and like the a guy with alopecia and the fake eyebrows or whatever the fuck. He's like, he's like listening to it. And then at the end, he's like, he's like, you guys, it's fucking fantastic. Right. Reminds, he's like, it reminds me of Jimi Hendrix and The Who. I just don't know what we could do with something like that. You know what I mean? And it's like, I don't know what to do with something that reminds you of Jimi Hendrix. I just like, yeah. I, don't, I don't know what to say. So like, that, that's how these meetings are going. And like, really quickly, we're kind of jaded to the experience, right? We're really okay. quickly like, okay, like, what the fuck? This is obviously we, you know, it's better for us to kind of like kick it where we are in the in Did you have a humor of them? Did you ever be like, yeah, man, that's, that's great. Or were you just like, walk out? Like, who are you? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, besides a fucking paycheck, it's like, who are you? Yeah, you know yeah, yeah. I mean? This doesn't even sound like Jimi Hendrix, you fucking idiot. You know what I mean? So it's like, who are you? You don't even know what you're talking about, you know? And, and that's fine. And they don't need to know what they're talking about for what they're doing because they're there to like, uh, service bands like the killers you know that's Mm -hmm. what they're for you know at best right so um travis ends up meeting this guy john seidel who's west coast and r for v2 v2 is richard branson's uh new label his second stab at doing an independent label with his own money you know Mm. and like I think the white stripes are already signed there. I know Moby's already signed there and it's kind of like an interesting collection of artists, right? Mm-hmm. So this is the guy that had a hand in signing the white stripes and he has already signed the burning brides, which is like a f- friends of ours, you know, mm-hmm. band. we actually took on tour in the UK for the first time. We were like, yeah, come support us. And I think on the back of that, whatever, whatever. So Burning Brides are like, you should check out, you know, our little brother band, Icarus Line. So um, Travis ends up doing a drive to San Diego with the A&R guy, John Seidel. They go on a drive. By the time they get back, he's like, John wants to hear the demo. Let's go to his house next week. Bring him the fucking songs. So here we come with our chunk of endless fucking feedback. We go to the house. Uh, Keith Morris is there when we get there. John Seidel with his long hair is, you know, the, the V2 office is in his garage. Um, Keith has to go. He leaves immediately. So I don't even think Keith stayed. To oh, listen right. to, uh, which is fine. You know, um, John has a picture of uh, Iggy being whipped by James Williamson wearing an SS uniform, like on the wall in the garage. And we're like, okay. Yeah, yeah, this is this is more the more the speed. Yeah, yeah, this might work out. You know what I mean? It's the first time I got excited at a fucking A and R meeting, like ever. You know what I mean? Um, 
we put the the tape in or the CD in and this dude starts listening to it and then he like lays down on the ground in his office and is like vibrating or some shit and we're looking at each other like this guy's gonna fucking sign us dude you know what I mean? like, <laughs> yeah. um, right so um yeah and we were right from there it was just uh you know after some negotiations we signed some horrific work for hire contract that like you know gouges our brains and like we'll you know just some horrific contract we have no idea what we're doing um but yeah after that we're working with uh john seidel and uh keith morris is his like right hand man so right. that also like, kind of got us in the door you know what i mean because mm -hmm. black flag is like part gospel to us you know yep. so uh, couldn't hurt to have a guy from black flag in the room when you know they're on your family tree no totally that is like it's basically the best omen you could have i guess you would help. <laughs> I was like, when it comes to um, actually putting penance together, obviously yeah. you had the demos or some of the demos, you had some of the idea for that. One thing, and this is like a really technical thing, but one thing that I've always loved about that album in particular is how you've obviously got Alvin and Aaron's guitars who are playing around each other their different styles and whatnot but what I've, I've always noticed about that record in particular compared to other ridiculous line records or other bands is that the tones of both of their guitars are so similar that they wow. sound like you know it's like twin buzz saws coming at you and i just wondered how much of that was an intentional production choice or how much was like that was just you know the limitations of the equipment you had when you were playing live or because it seems it's, it was really distinct I mean, everything on that record was uh, very intentional. Mm -hmm. We spent way too much money, had way too much time, um, and we were very deliberate, you know, in, in a chaotic way. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like, okay, let's uh, blow up a bass amp today. You know, there was things like that that were happening just uh, because, you know, we wanted to hear what a uh, – amp on uh, amp would sound like before it catches on fire you know um but more or less hold on one second i gotta let this guy in now no worries you wanna, you wanna come in here come on you gotta go lay down though go lay down get up there dude come on guy you gotta lay down next to your brother i'm doing the fucking interview you gun they don't care, you know, like, <laughs> not gonna fuck about this. But um, yeah, I mean, I guess the, the kind of making of that record as far as I can remember it, I mean, you know, by the time we're going to like do penance, I, I you know, we're, I think they gave us a budget of like 60 grand, 70 grand, something like that, just like crazy money, you know, yeah. I'm, I wish we could just stick it in our bank account and, <laughs> you know, run away right? Chill. <laughs> yeah but that's not going to happen so we have to spend it on an album um i i start meeting with producers because they're like there's no way they're letting us do this on our own mm. you know it's just like because that's my first thing i'm like oh we don't need a producer yeah we got we, this we tried one last time yeah we got it you know we'll get an engineer we'll fucking knock this thing out um and they're like, yeah, not a chance, not a chance, you know, because that's just like how that world works. They want a producer, right, to like yep. manage the project. Um, so I meet with a ton of kind of everyone under the sun at that point, a anyone who's like doing records. And uh, like one specific meeting comes to mind, which is a meeting with Dave Sardi. And it's the first time I've ever met him and, you know, kept in touch with Dave since this day, this meeting like um it's the first time i've ever met him we go out to lunch somewhere like pig and whistle or some shit somewhere in ho hollywood and uh i tell him what i want to do and i'm like really energized i'm like and i want to fucking like this this you know like sweets and all this shit you know i have like a fucking tirade of a map set out for what i want to do with the record and he's like he's like what do you need me for yeah he's like, he's like, just do it 
you know what you want to do. You know what to do. Get an engineer and do it. You know, and I'm like, they're not going to fucking let me, you know. But at that point, I'm like, yeah, I do need to do that. So I start trying to look for a fucking patsy or something. I'm like, who can we hire that will just stay the fuck out yeah. of my way? But the label will like think we've hired a producer, right? And uh, so I'm... I'm trying to find somebody who has enough gravitas that they'll like hire them, but not so much that they're going to like stand on my neck the mm -hmm. whole time, you know? Um, so our friend Mike Masmana comes up, he's done some cool work with this band Lilies in Philadelphia. He knows our bass player, Don from Philly, whatever. And like, I'm like, fuck it. This guy sounds good. And I hit him up and I'm like, look, we're going to hire you, but like, also we're producing the record with you, you know, um, little did I know that Mike is like, uh, has a very strong personality and opinion, but it's all for the better. You know, right. um, we hire, we hire Mike and that's when we start the record. Um, I end up working with Mike on every project since then in some fashion, for the rest of my life, you know, we've ended up working on it, but you know, two weeks into it, I was like, ready to fucking, I was going to fight it. And, <laughs> you know, two weeks into, you know, we do three days tracking the fourth day. He, he doesn't even show up. And it's just like, what the fuck is going oh, on? Shit. You know, it was, it was wild. You know, we were all wild though. It's not him. It's all, everyone was insane. You know, everyone's insane. And also intensely wanting to, do a good job mm -hmm. you know it's, it's very strange balance between you know uh being insane and on drugs but also being super focused on delivering something that uh lasts meaningful yeah yeah which is it's a it's a it's a strange focus that that provides you know because um you know, even though you, you might not be relatable to humanity at that point, as far as like uh, being able to channel some some kind of like deliverable performances, I think that uh, somehow we we got it there. And you know, in no small credit to Masmano, Masmano was able to hang out with you know these people who are like uh, night creatures. You know, he was one of us, so we're all just moving as this like black cloud through the streets of Hollywood at night in and out of studios and just like day to night, night to day, whatever we show up, he's still asleep from the day before, you know, it's just, it was like, uh, you know, we were like these like slugs moving through space. It was, it was pretty insane, but it, it was a lot of fun. And uh, even though the music was like, very kind of written because we took a whole summer before we went into the studio, booked out a studio and recorded all the songs every day for a summer. So every day we would like hit the songs again, play them differently every day, come home with CDs every day. And like, it wasn't like we were necessarily taking notes and, you know, it wasn't scientific, but we just, really got used to playing the songs in a in whatever way they came out that day you know well, they must have just been like part of your dna at that point you've just like submerged so much that it can just be an extension of your of you know your yeah. mood or your whatever you want to do that time Com complete immersion you know in what we're doing you know and i i don't know if i've ever maybe only a, a couple times since been able to like dedicate to the development of a project like that. You know, we really, we, that was, that was the luxury that we were afforded mm. was, and it's something that like, uh, I don't know, it's like hard to do without money or if you don't I was gonna say, does, does anyone get the chance to do that anymore? Really? Like, yeah, you know, yeah, rich kids, rich kids or people <laughs> who uh, are fine with not eating, you know, for years, you know? Um, but, but you say that though, like, because what I was just thinking, like, you know, I, I guess technically anyone can, cause you've got 
the studio equipment but at the same time is there not even though you had an expansive amount of time is there not like some form of like positive friction in the sense that you aren't just having an unlimited time in your own personal space you are like in a studio there is some sort of do you think that yeah. also is like kind of driving things in a way rather than for going sure. in your bedroom for an unlimited amount of time for sure there's nine to five parameters on it yeah there, it's not unlimited time it's a summer mm -hmm. you know it's going to run out and also we know at the end of this moment we're going to commit this to tape mm -hmm. you know so that there is there's an objective here you know like we know that we're preparing for three days essentially you know it's almost like an athletic mindset you know we're we're training for like the three days we get to perform this at sunset sound because we can only really afford a week there yep. you know so all of this all of this is preparation for like a performance you know um at home you know i don't i from my experience it tends to be more of a uh you know it's this sketch pad that can like collect momentum and then turn into a thing mm -hmm. you also can put up well i'm just speaking from personal experience but i feel like you can procrastinate through more creation as well in the sense of like yeah, endlessly yeah and you're like, and you don't, you, you kid yourself into thinking, well, I'm not procrastinating. I'm not being unproductive. I'm just following this other idea, even though you know that you're actually detracting away from the main thing you wanted to work on. It could take forever. We also have record labels and managers and people checking in at all mm -hmm. times. Even if they're not really prodding us, there's this illusion of, uh, you know, pressure or, you know, some kind of, team spirit going on here where people are like they're checking in they want to make sure that your you know your trajectory is still the same thing that everybody hasn't quit the band or whatever you know mm. um, so i think that those you know i think outside pressure and systems honestly has always been good for me i think it helps right it just like i say it gives it, it enough of that you need enough of that fire to give you that you know force forward but enough where you can explore and you know try and blow up a bass amp and shit like that <laughs> probably a little bit of runway with a lot of pressure and you can do a lot how so when you're recording over that summer at what point do because you get to work with alan Mulder and cal andrews which is pretty crazy from a mixed point of view obviously alan Mulder producing everything in the nineties onwards, um, and Ken Andrews from failure, like what, tell me a little bit about what that experience was like. Um, at a certain point, wasted our entire budget making the fucking thing, like doing the tracking vocals, recording the budget is gone long mm -hmm. since gone. We're great at wasting money. You know, um, we are just like, Hey, it's done, but we still need to mix it. We have no money. So they're like, the label's like, okay, well, find someone to mix it. Cause we're like, we'll mix it. And they're like, no, you won't. Of course. <laughs> so, uh, they're like, find somebody to mix it. So we're like, all right, uh, let's get Alan Mulder, you know? And they're like, oh, man, you can't afford Alan Mulder. We're like, yeah, probably not. We send a song to Alan Mulder. He's like, I'd love to mix this record. Sick. I I guess he does us a deal. I don't know. Probably, who knows? I don't know. I think it costs as much to mix the record as it did to record the thing. And it's like happening in a fraction of the time. The guy's mm. not, he's not cheap at this point, right? He's doing, he did, yeah, 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 as Fever to Tell, like the week before, you know, or whatever it is, right? So uh, Alan Mulder says, yes, we're excited. He, you know, he's, he, did my bloody Valentine, the first Jesus and Mary chain. These are all kind of, uh, uh, sonic highlights that were, you know, that, that means something to us and also know that we're going to be in good hands as far as how we see this thing jumping out of the speakers, you know, cause that's always a huge intention for that record is that, you know, uh, we just really don't want it to sound how a lot of the records are sounding 
at that point because there's so you know a lot of our contemporaries uh even at the drive-in you know they're like awesome live band that like never really made a record that sounded that great to me you know the mm -hmm. records came across kind of flat and you know uh i think we probably made a better record than we were a band live with penance you know maybe i don't know but um we felt safe going out to mix with Mulder. So we flew out, we're mixing at Eden Studios, which is, I think, no longer um, mm. kind of a classic studio. Nick Lowe worked out of there doing all the stiff record shit back in the day. And they put you up in a flat across the way and you stay and you, you know, get up every morning, meet Mulder in the fucking, you know, cantina. Everyone eats breakfast and then you start working on mixing your album um to be honest some of the songs weren't even finished i had to go in on the weekend with the assistant engineer and like track some vocals here and there because i we still weren't done you know what i mean i'm i'm the worst you know i'm just like oh, don't make me fucking sing you know i was like i'd rather you know i'll wait till the it's like hey we're gonna print the mix i'm like okay i'll sing it you know that's um, the process i guess that's your process. <laughs> it, has be, it has to be the end of the line for me to be like, I'll fucking do it. Um, you know, it's like either a hundred grand producer on the other side of the wall being like, come on, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like there's going to be one less song unless you do this. I'm like, oh. <laughs> um, but I think, I don't know. We were there for like two weeks, maybe, you know, mm -hmm. five days a week and just like blasted through it with him. He was great. So fucking so fucking professional to work with uh just a great mixer you know uh no ego no uh it, w it wasn't like working with a producer you know mm -hmm. he was truly a mix engineer in every sense of the word delivered what we're asking for you know we could sit there and you know we really pushed we, we he really let us push him especially for a bunch of nobody shit bags from LA and he really let us, he really let us push him. I mean, at one point he did throw a chair at the wall. I remember this, like, and it, I, even I was shocked. I was like, Oh fuck. I was you like, like, oh, fuck. We've done it. We've done it. We've broken him. I'm going to go smoke. You know what yeah. I mean? It was, it was like, I think we're fucking, I think he's done. You know, he came back in, got back to work, but a total scientist and, um, you know, we were asking for like these impossible things. You know what I mean? We're like, we want everything loud. We want everything louder than everything. Can you do that? You know what I mean? It was really like that kind of shit. Not, we wouldn't say it like that, but it was, I can only imagine, you know, yeah. after like, years of producing and mixing records, I can only imagine what a fucking headache it was. Luckily the music wasn't garbage. So there was like something to work with. You know, there was like energy there already. So it's like, fine, let's find it, you know? But yeah, we, we were, uh, me and Aaron were fucking demanding, you know? It's just every, kind of every inch, we knew every inch of the record. We mm -hmm. knew every, every sound and like knew where every level should be, you know? And it may not seem that way from listening to the record because it's just like, you know, kind of chaotic in spots but i would say more or less we knew every every second of the record we knew where where it should land i mean yeah you must have done from that amount of like the pre-demos the amount of time recording it and then that time and i was going to say like it doesn't it actually doesn't when i listen to it i don't think like oh this is a molder record but what he was able to do is obviously get everything like you say what you wanted without sanding down any of the edges and it yeah. just is kind of, yeah. I mean, some of the bass sounds, some of those drum sounds, I was just so, and like I say, that, that like twin guitar assault at the same time, it's I'm hard pressed to find another album that, that sounds like that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a bizarre one. And a lot of the credit goes to Masamano as well. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Masamano is engineering all the sounds that show up there, you know? So Mulder's working with a really good, great foundation. Yeah. And um, I mean, shit, he's, I think he mixed it. I don't even remember if he mixed it on a Pro Tools. I think he just mixed it on an SSL doing automation, you know? I mean, it's like, it's back then, you know, maybe, maybe some Pro Tools, but uh, he, 
it's a it's a testament to his uh, engineering skills. You know, he he delivered exactly what we were looking for, and I'm sure that uh, it wasn't always easy. Um, yeah, oh, I, the result speaks for itself. I think. So how did how did Ken Andrews get involved? It's just one track, isn't it? Is it on the lash or spit on it? Yeah, or? We, we always had trouble mixing on the lash. I don't know what the problem was. There was like some kind of. There was some something in the breakdown that just like didn't work out in the mixing sessions with Mulder and we never quite got it. And I think we, I forget whose idea it was. It might've been Aaron's. I don't remember, but we flipped the track over to him and we got a rough mix and it was close. Right. So we're like, okay. And we went down to his studio and I think within a couple hours we had it and that was it. You know what I mean? It was, it was like, at that point, we had already mixed the rest of the record, so there was kind of a standard and a, like there was like a, a a language to the whole thing to be able to measure it. You know what I mean? Once you have the house built, you know where to put a table. You know, it's yeah. that kind of, so it was a lot easier that way. You know, um, but uh, all I remember was he was you know really uh, mellow and got it done fast and everyone got along and i think that's the only time i've ever seen the guy i don't well, think i've even listened to failure to be honest i don't even like you know what i mean i don't even well, I, that, I mean that's why it kind of like rang out to me as been when i read it i kind of like double double took because i don't put i love failure but i don't put you guys in the same i heard him no. once and it sounded like nickelback to me or something and i was just like, i don't like this you know what i mean but that was like after we had worked with him you know I, th- I think he did a great job uh but yeah i heard the band once and i was like oh fuck i don't like this <laughs> but it's just not yeah. my music you know what i mean are you um how are you fixed the time i mean i'd love to chat more but i don't want to take time i mean how are you i'm i'm good i mean like it's yeah end of the day here so i'm good Oh, um, yeah, I'm good too. Let me grab a cigarette though, real quick. Yeah, yeah, man. Sick. All right. So, penance. Uh, one thing I was going to just to wrap up on penance, and it was really yeah. just to ask your thoughts on it. Like, it's often, you know, when people look at the Icarus line, it's always kind of regarded as the album for me. Like, obviously, I think sure. the whole catalog is great, but like, how does that, from your perspective, it's that something you ever do you feel comfortable with that? Do you agree with that? Do you resent it? Like, or is it just what it um, is? It is what it is. Like I never really listen to any of the stuff I've done after I do it much mm-hmm. so, to me. I don't know. I was proud of really proud of it at the time. Um, and it got probably the biggest push. Mm. You know, so I, you know, I kind of keep that in mind that it, it got the biggest sort of like a media push out of all the records I've made. So it would make sense that that, that record is kind of seen as the, you know, definitive uh, statement of the band. Um, but also, you know, we were really, uh, we really were moving with intent. So yeah, it, it's whatever, if anyone likes anything I've done, I'm cool with it. You know, I don't fucking listen to it. I don't, <laughs> like, if I had to sing those songs today, they'd probably have to put me in the hospital or something. I don't even know the words, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. But, uh, hey, cool. Sure. It's, a good, it's a good problem to have, right, I guess? like, It's not, for me, it's not the, the definitive record of the project for me. For me, it's all things under heaven. I was going to say, I thought, I thought you might say, that. I think I've, I've seen you say that before. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, I mean, yeah, I think, I mean, I still didn't know how to achieve what I wanted to do at that point. I just didn't have like the artistic vocabulary to really mm-hmm. do what I wanted to do. You know, it's like, we're listening to, Sun Ra and Coltrane and the Stooges and, you know, My War and like whatever, you know, Throbbing Gristle and Suicide. And like some of those influences are in there, but we're like super juvenile at that point. And we're also, um, you know, uh, it's it's more of a collective in a way, you know, I'm, I'm you know, we're, we're, 
we're making compromises so that everybody gets to play on the record and yeah uh, i think that you know that's part of the beauty of it and then it's also why you know there's maybe a a, a failure on some level to like um push push it towards where ultimately i was hoping the band can go at some point we're kids yeah i mean but more so than I mean, it's a detour slightly but i really I, yeah i'm not saying this just to like blow smoke but it's really interesting having kind of done this exercise that i just done of like going through canker sores and the early part of icarus and like through and then obviously like i'm familiar with your, your solo material it's like you can really trace this evolution of i guess what you you know what you're saying in terms of like what your intent where you're wanting to go there's you know there's breadcrumbs on each album from what the next sound is going to be even if that's oh, not fully decided and it's you can really trace it it's, I, th I think it's really interesting especially because in that early period and also even after icarus line you've like quite prolific in terms of what you put out so there's you can see these like little stepping stones i that's how i perceive it anyway for sure i mean the whole thing you know i feel like i've been making the same record since i started you know and i try to do it better each time that's really kind of what's been going on it's like I, I don't think i'm saying anything really new i'm just finding a new way to say it mm -hmm. so when we get to black lives at golden coast obviously at that point it's quite a significant lineup change so had did aaron get to tour penance and then leave or did he leave prior to oh, yeah. penance yeah, 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 yeah. We toured Penance for about two years, I think. Right. That's a band, you know, the band who made the record tours, the record. And um, even though we're touring Penance, we're already playing a good chunk of Black Lives on the road, almost immediately. You know, as soon oh, wow. as we finish Penance, we start writing new stuff, you know, because I'm like, ah, fuck that stuff. Let's let's do something else. Mm -hmm. You know, so by the time we're done touring Penance, I think we're playing at least half the material that ends up on Black Lives. Right. Wow. And Aaron, okay. Aaron playing guitar on like Frankfurt Smile and stuff like that, stuff that ends up on on Black Lives, you know. Um, and then I think I think the last tour that Aaron did, I can't remember if it was with Courtney Love or if it was with Lanigan. I, I think it was the Lanigan tour. We Lanigan calls us out to uh, support him on the tour for Bubblegum, and Sick. He, yeah, totally. You know, and so we're 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 uh, the support act for Lanigan's Bubblegum tour. And at the end of that tour, you know, the band is in shambles, like physically. You know, we've been touring for years at this point, nonstop. I think we've gone around the world like three times at this point, and. And the only pause we had in between mono and penance is to make penance and then we keep touring. You know, we tour right. the time mono gets out till we come home, record penance, and then we leave again. I mean, before penance is even out, we're, we're touring. You know, we had spent our entire tour support budget for penance before the record even drops, you know, um, because we're like, hey, they'll have to give us more, you know. <laughs> um, so we so we your total road lizard then by the time you get to this point like reptilian oh, yeah. almost <laughs> you have no interest of you know being at home you know yeah. any opportunity we have to tour we'll take it you know um some better than others you know but you know primal screams asking us to go on tour we go on tour with them in the middle of that tour yeah yeah yes asks us to do a show on the day off we fly to new york play with them come back to la and continue the tour you know it's like we're we're going we're going for broke. Even spiritualized asked us to go on tour in the middle of that, and uh, I forget what it was. I think we ended up touring with Yaya yeah, yeah, Yaz instead of spiritualized, which uh, was not exactly what I wanted to do. Nothing against Yaya yeah, yeah, Yaz, but I, you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, was like a monumental record to everyone in the band. We all yeah yeah, yeah. And, I can uh, imagine. Yeah, I think it was just that uh, the Yaya yeah, Yaz yeah, tour paid a little better and we'd be able to afford it. You know, we don't have cushions. So we had to do that once and we turned down the spiritualized tour, which is like heartbreaking, right? Um, but by the time we get home, Jeff, the captain stays in Portland after the last Lanigan show, 
we play the show and at this point everyone's just insane like smoking mm-hmm. crack whatever you know what i mean like literally crack smoking psychopaths um with no I, I don't think i even had a place to live you know no one has a home aaron's the only one that has an apartment everyone else is either going back to their parents house or a hotel or whatever you know we don't live anywhere we're like these like vagabonds that just go on the road um jeff stays in portland he doesn't say goodbye he doesn't say anything someone just tells us he's not coming back with you guys we're like okay fuck him you know we drive home. um when we get home i think we do a rehearsal and Aaron shows up with his hair all cut off because we're all like long hair, like, you know, hood, just like hoodlums. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Long hair thugs, you know? And Aaron shows up with this weird, like, angular haircut. And I'm like, oh, God, look at this fucking guy, you know? And, <laughs> all right. Bought a copy of Nylon magazine, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, but. Little did we know he was trying out for Nine Inch Nails that day. He didn't, you know, we didn't know. All right. Uh, he gets the gig and quits the band via letter, which w- was heartbreaking to me, even though that's probably all I deserved at the point, at that point, because none of our relationships were good, even within the band. It wasn't bad, but we're uh, ill-adjusted men from like a bad part of town. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. We don't talk our feelings you know we talk about like you know can i uh borrow a cigarette you know or you sucked last night get it together whatever you know what i mean and i had already been sort of soft petitioning for don to play guitar and aaron to move to bass which i know aaron was not excited about um because I, I liked the way Don played guitar in Ink and Dagger, and I just wanted the band to evolve in a different way. It was like, okay, we did Penance. We did that. I don't want to do that again. There's no yeah, reason. Yeah. Um, Aaron was probably nonplussed about this and uh, saw an exit and took it, you know, which, yeah, a lot of people would. Me, probably not, but, like, I'm the driver. You know what I mean? You can't jump out of the car. I'm driving. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's gone. Don comes on to guitar and Alvin is playing guitar, bass, whatever. And we're effectively a four piece at this point. I'm probably playing some guitar as always, you know, um, up until this point, I play guitar at rehearsals and uh, kind of choreograph from that position. Right. And then I'll figure out vocals later. That's basically why I'm never prepared for vocals. Cause I'm, that sounds like a Joe Cardamone special there. Yeah. I'll figure out the vocals later. <laughs> totally. Um, so we, what happens? Okay. This is what happens. I go to Portland to see what's going on with Jeff. Me and Alvin drive up to Portland and it's like Honda Civic. We go up, Jeff's a cab driver. He's like, moved in with this girl. He's a fucking cab driver telling us wild stories of fighting people in the streets, whatever. I'm like, Hey, can we jam for a couple of days? He's like, sure. We jam in. You ever heard of this band Yob? No, I think you're like a, like a heavy doom band. I don't right. even know if you've seen yet, but we're at their house in their basement jamming on their shit. We write six songs, something like that. Go back home with some tapes come home like okay we got some we got something going on here at this point nobody is in their right mind no one's dealing well with being at home i'm living in a fucking hotel called the magic castle god knows what i'm doing all day i don't think i left the room for like you know two months straight you know i'm the only food i'm eating is like the apples that they drop off at your doorstep in the morning you know it's just insanity um but focused on music as always you know mm-hmm. i have a full track i'm making music we invite the anr people over john seidel and uh, keith morris to hear our demo tapes i think i still have the tapes i haven't heard them since we played it for them but i'm pretty sure it was like you know 25 minutes of like noise you know there's not even a drum beat and i'm like this is what we're gonna do guys <laughs> need the money today and they're just yep. looking 
It's like, we're not giving these guys any money. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah? Fucking drop us, you know? And he, they were like, just get your shit together. We don't need to drop you. I was like, no, drop us. Someone's going to oh, man. Get up with it. So I called the president of the label. I'm like, look, I need to be out of my contract. I got to fly, you know? And he's like, whatever, psycho. We're making no money off of your group. Who gives a shit? You're free. Go, you know? So we're released from our contract. For the next year, I kind of just like fumble around trying to figure out how to like get a new record deal, getting new managers, whatever, whatever. Um, We record various versions of the new songs at different studios, not really working on an album, but kind of like just, I don't know what, we're like workshopping what we're going to do. Eventually, some of those demos make it to V2 in the UK and they hear it and they're like, oh, this is fucking sick. V2 ends up signing the band back for more than we've gotten. In the first mental. (laughs) Total swindle. It was great. Um, So we get signed back to V2, get the money, and that's how we start making Black Lives, get Masamano back. And uh, yeah, we jump into the studio and the making of that record is kind of um, a paranoid disaster. By the end of the record, Don's not really in the band anymore. Right. Uh, he moves to New York. We try to finish the record in New York. Me and him are not seeing eye to eye. Um, and our relationship becomes unraveled. Everybody's high. Everybody's insane. The record sounds like that. And it has this kind of, uh, I don't know, it's weird. Even though there's guitar on the record, the guitar almost feels like it's in a different universe than the rest of the album. I, it's the most bizarre sounding record to me, you know? And I was... it just, it's dysfunction, you know? It just sounds like fucking dysfunction. Well, I was going to say that because I was like, this is one of the things that I really like about it is that it sounds like Icarus but it sounds like the lineup has changed in the sense of, you know, there's no longer this dueling guitar thing. There's like you say, there's a guitar, but it's kind of over there. It's somewhere in the mix. It's kind of, it's, it's, you can hear the reconfiguration of everyone. And I guess the kind of dysfunction and all of that stuff, but it's kind of like focused in, in this weird way that sounds like you, but also I think it sounds that is the outlier from the whole like catalog it's it sounds more different than any of the other stuff for sure for sure it's all it you know to me i don't really listen to it but in my uh in my mind it reminds me more of like a i don't know like a pil record when like half the members quit or something like that you know it's it we had a hard time getting don to even play guitar on the record half the, he was like you know he was going through his own shit so half the time we're getting these tracks that we're not even sure what goes with what you know and it's just uh we were assembling a fucking uh disjointed nightmare you know um which is weird because it still does have kind of like a muscular intent to the whole thing you know uh and the vocals here's the thing there's another weird factoid about that record we record and mix the entire thing on tape right even though we don't need to like penance is recorded half on pro tools half on tape but i'm like eh, no nah. because everyone's you know people are saying uh you know you you need pro tools now you know back then it's a thing it's like oh you use pro tools you guys can't fucking i was like all right let's do this whole thing on tape which was yeah. insane we're like two twenty-four tracks everywhere we go. It's just like a total waste of resources and time. And um, yeah, so that's another reason why the record sounds like that because everything is just kind of these full takes. Nothing is manipulated really, and uh, it's just a bizarre record that sounds like it's cursed. It feels like it's cursed to me, anyways. I'm like this thing. It feels sick and cursed, and. Uh, it's weird because there's like sort of pop songs on on there sort of but well, this is what this is what i was going to ask i think that's really interesting that there's those kind of like there's a few tracks right that have that hazy almost dream poppy 
kind of acoustic they got very sweet acoustic melodies it's probably the one time i would say that it almost feels like a red herring in the catalog because it's almost a sound that doesn't get picked up again i wondered if there is is that just because with you weren't feeling it or it came out of like other ideas or is just i think i think it's it was definitely the combination of me and don working together you know because that's where he comes from in a way you know coming from philadelphia Uh, playing in that band Lilies, you know, um, that's just where he comes from is kind of like a psychedelic pop, art pop thing, you know, Uh, and, uh, you know, even though I like to drive, I also really want the people I'm working with to like feel ownership, too, because, you know, that's the only way we're going to move forward. So I think I think a lot of that is due to that. And then also, you know, we were uh, kind of branded as like this tuneless uh, barrage of insanity. And I kind of, I, I just thought it would be funny to write pop songs and then bury them under like discontent. <laughs> yeah. You know? So it was, it was like, oh, cool. I, yeah, I'll write, a, I'll write some pop songs, you know, and then here we go. But they're just, ultimately, they're completely fucked. And, no, you know, no one would ever consider it pop music. I mean, it's funny because they're really cool. They're the ones that, I mean, I guess by their nature, pop songs. But when I was listening to it, they're obviously the ones that kind of grabbed me the most first. And it's really funny that they're, you almost double take when you're listening to it the first time. You're like, what is this? nothing yeah. like what i've just heard either side it was like well, did i just did i just press shuffle by mistake it, it's weird yeah like victory gardens it's you know it was like oh fuck you know uh i'm gonna be like uh brian ferry avalon for like the afternoon even though i don't even really know what that is you know what i mean it's <laughs> just i don't know yeah it's it, it was we were bizarre man i don't i don't know we just didn't we didn't uh we didn't seem to really understand that like you had to like curate your sound towards like bite-sized chunks that were repetitive in order for the audience to follow along. It was just like, ah, we want to do this. So we'll do this now, you know? And I think that comes from growing up with groups like the Beatles and stuff like that, where it's like the emphasis wasn't about like, uh, you know, the Beatles had a sound because of who the people were, but not because of the style, you know, mm. they would do like, multiple styles within records. And I don't know. I just always thought that was so okay. You know what I mean? I always thought that like uh, um, style switches and beat switches, which I think is more acceptable today in some, in some genres than ever. Um, yep. Back then, not so much, you know, at that point it really kind of was, uh, you know, it's like uh, find your genre and sink your teeth in as deep as you can. Yeah. And there was almost like a, a stay in your lane kind of attitude. Right. Whereas now I think people are so used to streaming of just being like, Oh, I'll take a little from here and there and whatever. And it kind of matches. Yeah. yeah. Life's a playlist, you know, it's like you listen to Frank Ocean's record and it's a, it's a playlist, you know, mm-hmm. it's even though there's, you know, threads that tie it together, it's still like, you know, it can go anywhere it wants and no one bats an eye you know totally so wildlife then it come, there's a bit of a gap a, probably the longest gap right between black lives and, and wildlife probably yeah is i that, mean you would, you would know better than me <laughs> <laughs> so is this did the wheels just kind of fall off after that is that kind of why or was it more touring or it was more touring. I mean, we we still toured, you know, um, the band that made Black Lives never toured it, you know, Jeff and Alvin. Yeah, of course. But uh, as soon as the record was done, I found guitar players and we kind of almost reinterpreted the record because it wasn't going to sound like that anyways. And, mm. um, you know, we I think we toured for like a year and a half or something like that. That's not really the reason for the gap. The The main reason was um v2 fell apart as soon as the record came out like the day our record comes out the label ceases to exist we're just like oh yeah it sounds sounds about right for us so we're labelless again um which is like you know it's not news this has happened all the time um 
so I figure out a way to build my own studio because at this point I don't want to have to rely on fundraising to be able to create, you know, that's really mm -hmm. my like drive at this point. So I fundraise enough to build a studio at my house or wherever I was at that point. Um, except for the thing is I don't know how to engineer. I don't even know anything. You know, I've been in studios my whole life at this point, but I'm never, you know, I, I know very little. I know what things do. I don't know how to do it with them. So I spend the entirety of the production of wild, wildlife training myself to engineer while I'm doing the record. And that's right. probably why it took so long. Cause I, I think it took me a year to mix it. And also I'm like up against these records that are mixed by like giants, you know, like Dave McNair mixes black lives and fucking Mulder and fucking, you know what I mean? I'm like, Oh God, you know, if I turn in a piece of garbage, this is really, this is it, you know, this is the end, I, you know, and this is, my first stab at mixing anything, you know, besides mm -hmm. four tracks or whatever the fuck, you know. So that's probably what what you know took took the majority of the time there. That's the gap is me sort of just like experimenting and like a lot of it going wrong, keeping some of the wrong and trying to find more right, you know. Um, and that that's wildlife really is me trying to do that. And also at that point, I didn't know if it was going to be a record for the Icarus line or if it was going to be for myself, because there right. was like a good chunk before it came out where I was wanting to call it Joe Cardamon versus the Icarus line, you know, mm -hmm. and kind of have it splinter off. Um, but I think whoever ended up wanting to put the record out wants it to be called the Icarus line. And I'm like, I don't give a shit and let's go, you know? Um, but yeah, that was, that was the first record that I mostly made at home. I mean, we still went to sunset sound and did basic tracks with an engineer friend, Greg Gordon, who was a mentor to me at the time, helped kind of like push me into the ocean um, and gave me some directions and was like, all right, well, give me a call if you need some help, you know, but uh, a lot of that record was, was me doing trial and error, like, oh, what does this knob do? I mean, it's just insane. I had no idea, you know, it's like plop down a mixing console in front of me and be like, all right, what do we do? You know, and I had never used Pro Tools either. I mean, it was, I had never done any of it. It was just like, fuck, all right, here we go. Shit. I mean, that's a lot to learn in, a, in a, even in a year. It was, it was, but it was, but you know, I had a great time doing it, you know, it, like even the frustrating parts, it was like, I have great mentors. I have like lifelines. I have Musumano, who's a fucking genius. I have Greg Gordon, who's a fucking expert. Um, so I can call these guys and be like, uh, you know, where's the thing? Where's mm -hmm. the, why am I only hearing one track? You know what I mean? It's just like insane phone calls that like anyone that knows what they're doing would be like, yeah, uh, you've muted them all over here. You know, that kind of shit. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's that's what it takes. I mean, everyone, people often are like, will you show me how to use, train me how to do this? And it's like, train you, train yourself. I mean, that's the only way to learn anything. You know, It really is, all, yeah. Right? You, you have to give a shit about what you're making and that will drive you to learn. 100%. Yeah, you need to be up against something, a little a literal barrel, bar barrier to go and then read something or have someone tell you because if you just read it or someone tells you before you've got no got nothing to push against to figure out what the next thing is so it makes perfect sense um, i feel like um i feel like wildlife is uh, I, it's one of my favorites and i think it's like almost the most accessible icarus line album in the mix it's got this um i always like there's a and I've heard um, Josh Homme mention it a couple of times of like likening bands to like pirates and like when they're like rolling into town on tour and like that album, you know, in a cool way, not in a Pirates and Penzance way, like in a cool like outlaw way kind of is what that album evokes to me with a lot of the more blue blues, the acoustic side of things, the group vocals. Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, again, it was like, I think we were trying to figure out, or at least I was trying to figure out how to stack hooks into a record that wasn't conventional. Uh -huh. You know, I think that was like one of the main operations with that album was like, 
everything's a hook. The drum line's a hook. You know, the guitar's a hook. So everything's a hook, even though I don't want anything to really be conventional. Um, and also, I have like new band members mm -hmm. that I have included here. So everyone, there was a good core group that was hanging out every day and like, Wanted everyone to sing and sing on it. Wanted everyone to be part of it. Again, when we started it, I didn't know that it was an Icarus Line record. So there was no kind of real, uh, it, it wasn't like uh, measured up against anything to me. You know, it was kind of like, okay, we're making something. I don't know what it is, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, a bunch of pirates for sure. <laughs> it sounds It sounds great, man. So does that mean like going forward? So like, as you look at slave vows and avowed slavery, so was everything then subsequently recorded in your home studio or did you still kind of venture out into different? Um, I'm trying to think after that, after that I built a studio in Burbank. Right. That's where the rest of the catalog was recorded from like the ground up. That was mm -hmm. it. Yeah, it was, the studio that wildlife was made in was like a garage basically right you know so there was a tiny room for like amps and stuff and a tiny room for mixing and overdub or whatever but um the drums and all that were done at sunset sound in a proper room and like the band played together after that i built the place uh valley recording in burbank and uh it was purpose-built to be the the home for like the Icarus line to like do whatever we were going to do for the next few years. And so, yeah, we didn't have to go anywhere anymore, which was pretty, pretty amazing. We were, we, we could set up, leave mics up and uh, just, you know, play when we needed to, you know? Did that create then a little bit of a sense of like what you had in penance where you kind of had that, that freedom to, to then just, experiment and try stuff for sure for sure i mean uh yeah i think like slave vows is one that people kind of tie to penance like spiritually in a way or mm -hmm. something like that you know and um i think that we did afford ourselves time to experiment i think um lance came back to the group who was an original member who also wrote on a lot of the songs for penance like lance was the bass player up until the recording right you know so that energy that he had um came back to the band for slave vows you know um and uh it's almost more of the original band at that point than ever really because it's alvin lance and myself and jeff you know or actually ben hallett at that point but you know um there was definitely it definitely has like a, a kindred feel you know mm -hmm. to, to uh, penance in a sense but at this point getting closer to uh having a little more freedom within the songs you know it's not it's not so nailed down by structure like every time we play a song it's it could be you know any length depending on when the vocal cues come from me you know yep. and that's what's uh exciting about having your own studio and being set up and recording everything you do it's like if it happens great we, we got it and we're keeping it and it's done if it doesn't we'll try again tomorrow um but yeah slave vows i think we also kind of knew like if we couldn't turn out anything good then we probably shouldn't do the project anymore so right. it was kind of just I don't know, you know, it was it was a weird era. What what year is that? Maybe like twenty seventeen or twenty eighteen? I don't even know. I think it's twenty thirteen. Oh geez, see, I don't know. <laughs> uh yeah, so that's a weird era period for music even, you know. Mm. Um I don't even know what was going on around us, you know what I mean? I don't think we were like involved with our contemporaries very much. Um but yeah, I think it was basically uh it was just nice to play with childhood friends yeah in a, and uh you know all these guys are fucking you know lance is a fucking badass alvin's a badass you know these guys are just like they didn't come from other bands this isn't a super group type thing it's just like all these dudes that came from nowhere that are hard as fuck yeah you know and you've all got that shared experience as well and like to a certain so, extent just all on the same page totally there's you know there's 
shorthand for every move like no one has to talk about anything you know there's a weight to to everyone's uh, musicality at that point you know um so i'm super comfortable and safe mm -hmm. you know i don't have to babysit anybody in the room everyone yeah. knows what they're to do they put their heads down and they make it happen and we don't have to talk which is my dream i don't want to talk about it you know i just want to fucking go just um, just do it was it yeah. always the intention to have those t two you know slave vowels and then the companion because it's all basically a double album i mean yeah. track track wise number of tracks but length it yeah i mean there was we had been touring a lot leading up to that record um playing some of those songs but really it the only intention was to go in and make a record mm-hmm with no length determined so we just kept working on material and at this point i know there's probably five or six songs recorded that didn't even come out from those sessions you know what i mean so it was just you know uh we're just we're so immersed in in the sound of what we're doing that we're just four days a week even if anyone has a job we're there at six working on stuff and at this point for months we go down and we just work on music. We just keep working on music and everyone, um, it, w it was such a, it's such a good rapport at that point that it's just a joy. You know, everyone's really, really uh, locked into like having a, a good experience. You know, everyone's really having a good experience and really kind of, um, I don't know, it was, it was, uh, it was easy. You know, it was like an easy record to make. And I, do you think that was like an age thing as well like because you guys had, you'd all come up together but you also now like you had done some crazy shit you're kind of almost just yeah saying, no one wants a hard life you just want to like work sort of thing more relaxed and also it's me on guitar all the time at right. this point you know so i'm really able to kind of conduct in a way instead of being translated which for mm -hmm. me a huge thing so at this point i don't feel like there's not being giant compromise there's not giant compromises being made at this point you know um not that it oh you know com compromises are great at some points but uh you know you know at the age i was at then i was like yeah i need to play guitar on these things you know because there's like certain things that need to be expressed that i just i want to hear it a certain way and i i don't want to translate it and i'm here playing with my like high school buddies mm -hmm. you know just do it like we did it in the garage and that's what we did yeah that's cool it must add such a different dimension when you like you say you spend ages trying to convey what you want and then you, you can all you've all of a sudden found this language to kind of talk in must change the dynamic massively yeah it, it was it was a it was a beautiful uh it was a beautiful time for us i think i think it was a really freeing time and i think um for me, I finally got to develop as like a actual guitar player instead of someone that was kind of like composing for guitar, mm -hmm. you know, actually getting to like put it down on records, even though I'm, I'm kind of playing guitar on all of them here and there in little bits, mostly I'm composing for guitar and stepping away. And now I'm finally able to, um, allowing myself to perform, you know, which was, it was you know, it was exciting for me and. I think it helped uh i think it helped the momentum of the group too you know totally some great material came out of that and then so was it like when it comes to i'm imagining there was touring before settling down to do all things under heaven but oh, it was yeah. pretty quick succession in terms of release right because that's 2015 all yeah. things under heaven we do we do some quick like world touring you know um it's uh i think we end up touring with killing joke doing Sick. a bunch of dates um, a bunch of dates with the cult I, you know we do we do some pretty pretty great tours um and while we're out there we're already kind of developing what all things under heaven is gonna gonna end up being um lance leaves the group alvin moves back to base alvin played everything mm -hmm. obviously you know whoever was gone he'll jump on it he jumped in 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, like, you know, for a lot of Slave Bow stuff, he's playing keys, you know I mean? He's just, he was like the utility guy. He could just do whatever. Um, half the time, if we have a new member, he's teaching them the songs, not me. You know, that's like, he was insane that way. It would be like, hey, I don't even remember how to play this shit. Can you fucking show this guy, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we get back home and um, the lineup has changed again. Jeremy, who is a long time, you know, uh, contributor to the band here and there you know he's playing sax on penance even somewhere i think um ends up joining the band as a regular member on keys and horns and um i was really excited about the lineup that we have alvin's playing bass which is his like mother tongue that's his instrument he started on yeah uh, kyle spider on guitar who's probably you know my favorite guitar player in LA, you know, still to this day, it was like, this guy can play like, like how someone should be able to play. Um, and John Bennett is playing guitar, kind of like holding down, uh, sort of like, uh, meat and potato feedback duties. And just kind of like, he's, I mean, basically he's doing, he's the straight man. He's playing Alvin's role, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, Alvin did on guitar. So we kind of have like a wild man and a, and a straight man. And then there's me on guitar. So there's three guitar players in the room and uh, we did, we did it live. You know, we play the record live like over and over. That makes so much sense now. I didn't know that there was, I just assumed two guitars, but like thinking of that album now, yeah, it makes so much sense that there's, there's three of you in the mix. There's three guitars. And then I'm also doing loops the whole time. Right. So, like, basically everything you hear on that record is live. It's all happening right then and there, you know, which is like, I don't know if that means anything, but that's just how we, we did it. You know, we, we really wanted to, like, capture the band as how they sounded, you know. So, yeah, we would just play it live and hopefully, hopefully we, like, laid something down that felt good. And Ben Hallett's such a sick drummer that uh, he was really able to kind of uh, – hold the group together through even the most chaotic moments in the arrangements and um was it was a really good uh co-conductor I, I would say you know what mm -hmm. i mean because either the cues are coming from me or from him and we're kind of trading off depending on what needs to happen in the piece yeah. you know and uh everybody was just everybody had really uh strong responsibilities in the band which made made it so much freeing more freeing for everyone because since everyone is really alert and in tune um you know it gives us the freedom to do whatever the fuck we want because if somebody starts going in a different direction we can all follow that or yeah. if i start going in a different direction that day everyone can follow me you know there's no uh there's no roadmap on that record you know there's little things that are cues but like i guarantee you uh you know, Total Pandemonium was different every fucking time we played it. That's just the one that's on the record. Yeah. You know? Which is what I always wanted the band to be. Yeah. I mean, I think you can tell that as well from listening to it. Like it doesn't feel, it feels like one of those records where you're kind of stepping into a room where the music was already happening and you're just kind of catching, catching that moment of it. And if you move out, it's still going to be going on. And if you were to come in another time, you'd hear something different. You know, it's got that feel to it. Totally. It was the most fun I think I ever had making an album. Really? You know? That's so good. I Did mean, you know... Go on, sorry. The, the last track, Sleep Now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a masterpiece, yeah, my, by the way. That's like such a beautiful track. It, it, yeah, it's one of my favorites. Um, my, my dog of like however many years... I don't have kids, I have dogs, right? So my dog of like 10 years dies you know while we're making the record and it really you know really put me down i never had to like put it, a dog down before you know and for some you know i've had a lot of death in my life people i've lost people but for some reason losing my dog really affected me you know i got mm -hmm. this dog when i got signed to v2 everyone got apartments i spent my money on a dog you know what i mean like i don't know but uh so this is my guy you know and he's mm -hmm. like lived in the hotel with me like i'm carrying this guy around with me so i lose my dog and he, you know it's really uh it was a really kind of like moving experience just kind of hey take it easy zeus you're next you know what i'm saying <laughs> um 
this guy. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, losing the dog also kind of propelled me into this, like, I don't know, new stage of life where I was like, okay, I like saw this guy from birth all the way to the end. Oh, I'm going to kill this guy. <laughs> okay, so easy guy. The rain's got everyone acting crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyways, I'm fucking, I hang out at the studio all day before everyone gets off work to, to like get down to business, right? Every day I'm reviewing what we did the day before kind of just seeing where it's at and then coming up with like, what should we do today? You know, we don't really, we only have like three or four songs kind of, I just throw an idea out the day of, and then maybe we start generating that idea. And then that grows along, along the path towards wherever the ending of this recording is. Right. So it's like, Oh, we start this idea today. Maybe in a couple of weeks, we'll find one we like. Mm -hmm. Um, The sleep now loop happens kind of by accident about 15 minutes before everyone gets there. And for some reason, you know, I'm like hearing my dog in it, you know, it's just like one of those things where you just like hear somebody in a piece of music, you know, Mm -hmm. or at least I I will hear someone in a piece of music and I'm like almost brought to tears when I'm here in the loop. And, uh, you know, everyone shows up right as this is happening and I'm kind of overwhelmed, you know, and uh, maybe this is too much information, but uh, you know, I don't say anything to them, but we're already set up. We've been recording for weeks and I don't really say much. Uh, and I'm just, just like, uh, you know, I want it to just end up here. I don't, I don't know. This is it. I just get like this very vague description. Mm-hmm. And I get Alvin and I'm like, you know, you kind of, we've all been listening to this. We know what this is. All right. So we don't say much we go in the room and that's like the only time we ever played it. You know what I mean? We just walk in the room and Alvin, like holds down this beautiful sort of baseline and just kind of like that was it you know we never played it again we, there's no i don't even think there's any overdubs or anything on it it was just that and we never played it again and that was it and it's on the record you know and that's that's really what that record was to me was like moments like that is where it was just there's a few pieces on there where it's just like dude we never even you know we didn't even talk about it we just kind of conjured it and uh it was really beautiful, you know, once you finish a piece like that, it naturally like, you know, the the piece builds up and it lets go and then everybody, you know, kind of like uh, goes outside to smoke a cigarette and was like, oh, fuck, man, that was, that was nice, you know, um, and that's, that's why it's my favorite record, you know, because my experience yeah. was just, uh, it was beautiful, you know, and it really let me kind of uh, exist in music in a way that I don't think I really had figured out up until that point or been allowed to, you know, I didn't have the freedom to like, uh, you know, just let go of myself enough. And, you know, tr- I didn't have, I don't know if I had people I trusted enough around me, but that record, I really was surrounded by people who I just trusted and who were really uh, sensitive players and just r- really great musicians. And I felt supported in a way that I knew there was no going back after mm-hmm. that, after like being able to play music like that. It's like, I don't fucking care if anybody likes it. Like this experience is, uh, has such a positive impact on me as an artist that like, why would I deny that ever again? So, you know, it, that song, you know, informs the trajectory of where I'm going for the rest of my life, I think. I mean, I think you can hear it. I think that's what's it's so interesting hearing how it came about. It sounds like one of those like just magic moments of life, yeah. like serendipity, just everything happening. But um yeah, I love I love that track as well. And I, I do think I was gonna say, even before you said that, like you can hear it's kind of mapping out like when you think of, you know, Holy War, Corenta, the stuff you've done with Mark, like I can hear some of that yeah. in in that moment. So it's you know, kind of really fitting end to that album and then start of what was next at the end of the band that song yeah you know i knew i knew we were done like i knew it was the end like even though alvin wasn't really sick yet like by the time i had finished mixing or whatever you know i barely mixed it it was just like um i knew that was it i was like we don't have to do any more with this 
I knew that that was like the that was the final statement. It wasn't it wasn't because it was like oh I don't want to do this anymore. Or like we have nowhere to go. It was just uh, it just seemed like a nice place to leave it. Honestly, it was like if we leave it here, this is a good place. You know, I don't think leaving it on wildlife would have been the place to leave it. You know, that's not where the band was. You know, it, it just seemed like everything that we had work towards culminated in all things under heaven you know yeah yeah totally i agree i was going to ask you actually whether you had any kind of idea beforehand whether it was going to be the last one um just because it has that air of finality to it it just feels that way i think while we were making it strangely enough when we started it it was like let's fucking take over the world just like always you know it's like we're gonna fucking blow the roof off of this place and shut everyone down again here we go you know but while we were doing it i think uh i don't think anybody else knew i think Mm -hmm. i'm the only you know um i don't know why i knew but also alvin got sick not not too long after the finishing of the record so that was uh you know we couldn't really tour it and uh I wanted, we tried to tour it a little bit just out of respect um, for Universal because they were the ones that had released the record through one of their subsidiaries or whatever the fuck. Right. Um, but that did, that was ill fated. You know, I was like playing those songs without him was ridiculous. It was just like this against the spirit of what we've made here. You know, there's no, mm-hmm. we're reconfiguring a band. You know, it's just, it just became too far from the source for me. And it was like, half the reason why I'm still doing this is to do it with him. Yeah. You know, and that's like half the reason I'm doing this band is so that I can travel with my best friend, mm. you know, go to fucking, uh, you know, the Gaudi cathedral in Spain, you know, every summer and just like kick it, you know, that's like half the reason I'm doing this at this point, you know, is because I want to spend time with people I care about and it affords me to be able to travel in a way I'd never afford where I'm from. You know what I mean? Where I'm from, nobody fucking travels. Nobody goes anywhere. No, my parents never fucking went anywhere, you know, like ever, you know, because no one has money. So, you know, this was like uh, an amazing gift that like, even if I didn't make enough money to retire or even barely pay my bills, I got to travel like better than people with tons of money get to travel because it's, you know, people are feeding us and rolling out the red carpet in a venue anywhere in the world. And it's your birthday when you show up. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a tightly singular experience. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, um, I'm sorry for your loss with Alvin, man. It's yeah. It's much respect. Never gets easier, but you know, it is what it is. Like I'll, I'll end up, uh, I'll end up with him sooner or later totally and what a body of work you know that you guys could both all of you got to do over that time um this has been yeah this has been amazing man thank you for taking the time to uh chat i wanted to you know talk to you about um working with mark and stuff like that but we've just we've done so much but um check it out i got another one with mark Um, yeah travis mentioned man that was like such a curveball that's so exciting so we'll do it when that comes out mate i'd be so down there we go uh banger wasn't it i can't thank joe enough for his time for being so open and so willing to go into the weeds with me on all things icarus line if you made it this far i'll just wrap this up saying that this is an ongoing series so if you haven't already subscribed we do album reviews sort of day to day but we finish every week on some sort of special episode like this focused somewhere around the alternative rock in some way and uh, there'll be loads more interviews coming so subscribe share some thoughts show some love and i'll see you in the next video cheers mate bye